We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from Tabletop Bellhop Patreon patron Danielle, better known as Major Kayla, in our lobby chat room on Twitch. Are there board games that pick a time in history or region for the aesthetic that are actually good? Well, thanks for the question, Danielle. Uh, now, I found this question to be a bit ambiguous, so I actually reached out to Danielle on our Discord, which you can join at discord.tabletopbellhop.com, to get some clarification. Now, what Danielle meant by this is that there are many games that pick a specific point in history or a region for their theme, but do this in a very casual manner. And don't give that point, that, that, that region or point, time in history, the attention it truly deserves. Now, Danielle is a history major and sick of seeing games that do things like, for example, use Feudal Japan because it looks cool and Samurai are cool without actually trying to tie that theme to the game in any way except for the visual graphic aesthetic. Now, this goes for areas of the world, like in particular Japan, but also eras and specific moments in time as well. Uh, but it can also be expanded if you want to look at most theming from games from time and place to uh, intellectual property uh, and genres. So what I want to talk about here tonight to kind of broaden and narrow the topic both at once is to talk about thematic depth in board games. How deep is a theme? We don't want a surface level theme. We want depth that actually gets down to the mechanics. Now, what we've seen publishers and designers do to avoid this problem as uh, that they've done. And we're going to look at some games that actually get this right, that have good thematic depth or deep theming, and games that totally miss the mark by just pasting on a theme. Does your favorite game about, insert topic here, actually have anything to do with yeah. that topic? Or did someone just wave a theme over a finished product? Uh, now, we're not the misdirected mark, and we don't have Todd Crapper yelling out Definition Panda, but I would like to start out by mentioning what we mean by theme here, and I think everyone probably gets that, but just in case, this is the subject matter of the game, what the game's built on, the setting, the fluff, the background, the story, the paragraph you read at the start of the rule book before you get into actually how to play. This also includes what the players there are doing during the game, where they're doing it, and why they're doing it, as well as any like potential progression that happens during the game. Now, a great example that goes both ways that most people can relate to, for better or worse, is <laughs> Monopoly. There are literally thousands of Monopoly games themed for every school, city, TV show, movie, game that you can think of. But how many of those are actually just New York Finance with the names changed? How many are actually changed to represent this new theming? And I got to say, this is one that almost hits close to home because I, I no longer fall for it. But there was a while there where a new Monopoly would come out and I'd be like, oh, sweet. There's a Star Wars Episode 1 Monopoly back when we were all excited about Episode 1. Because the Monopoly came out before the movie did and got it and was like, no, it's just Monopoly. Like, like, come on, like, give me light side. Give me dark side. Give me something that feels like Star Wars instead of just building hotels that are instead called something else. Now, one of the things that happens with games is that themes may or may not have to do with the mechanics at all, which this is where we get into that thematic depth in Danielle's question. What we want is to find games where the theme does tie to the mechanics, or perhaps the other way around, the mechanics tie to the theme. You want those two to integrate. That's how you get a deeper game. For example, what theme does chess have? Everyone knows what the theme is, but I've never seen a mounted guy on a horse move in an L-shaped position to move up to attack a plebe. It just uh, maybe in that one movie where everyone's on motorcycles with lances, that might have happened, but that's about it. Yeah, chess is interesting, and I there are uh, reasons and 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 design mostly lost to history behind the types of movements of each. Uh, piece, but uh, what happens when you change the king to something else? Uh, in many cases, it may still work uh, from garden plants competing over the lawn to gods and goddesses battling. Uh, any sort of battle between two opposing foes often still makes sense. 
But mm-hmm. if you change it to, for instance, one I saw when I was looking around was two football teams. It suddenly makes a lot less sense. Sure, football is a battle of sorts, as Blood Bowl has proven to us, but an entirely different sort that is not at all well represented by chess. Unless maybe your game of sports ball chess is just one quarter black blitz. That's all it is. It's it's one blitz, but then you still wouldn't be going both ways. Yeah, you so wouldn't have a quarterback on both sides. So. <laughs> so, so that doesn't quite work. Yeah, no, totally true. Um, now, another thing that's interesting is, um, and this actually goes with something Roger just said in the chat, to him, mechanics should drive the theme and the art enhance it, not the other way around. And I disagree. I think it can go either way. Theme can come before or after mechanics. And you can totally come up with an awesome theme and find mechanics to fit for it. Or you can already have your mechanics and then try to think of a theme that fits those mechanics. And I've got to say, mainly theme driving mechanics is where you get the deep theme because you're starting with a theme you care about. Whereas if you've got some neat mechanics you came up with, maybe a nice neat dice pool system or a, a roll and move that's actually fun, trying to find the game that fits that is probably going to end up with more of a pasted on style theme. Right. If you were able to paste a theme onto your mechanics, who's to say someone else isn't also? I think is is a lot of what happens. You may have developed a fantastic abstract game which can take themes like a coat of paint or wallpaper, uh, but that generally means it's not going to be deeply themed uh, because someone else is just going to wipe off that paint and put on a different set. Which is actually what happens a lot. And I don't know if a lot of uh, casual gamers who just buy games and play them realize this, but a lot of games, by the time they get in your hands, have a completely different theme than the original designer intended. When you are marketing a game to publishers, one of the rights you are probably going to have to wave away if you want your game signed is you're going to have to give up your theme because that publisher is going to have an idea of the type of themes they want, what they want to sell, what the current trend is etc. And they're going to retheme your game. Like that's part of what they do to go. Yeah, well, that's a really cool theme, but no one's going to buy that. Here's something that's exciting right now. Right. And to steal something, uh, nothing, nothing personal, Roger, but to steal something from the chat room, a game on spiders might not be in the public zeitgeist right now. But if you swap that over to slimes in a dungeon, maybe it does work. And maybe that is what people want right now. And that's where the publisher may decide to take your game, even if you have developed this really awesome game that you, as far as you're concerned, is all about spiders. Now, another good example of this, just jumping back to our last episode, which you can check out, that's episode 202. We reviewed a card game, a trick-taking card game called Court. And as part of that, I was like, wait a minute. This seems like it's been rethemed because... There, there was one card that said, um, I forget now, workshop, I think, instead of instead of courtroom or, or, or court. And I'm like, what's that from? And I've actually now heard back from the designer who read the review and said, oh, no, it was originally supposed to be a steampunk theme with engineers building their workshop, which actually makes the steampunk looking horse symbol and the butterfly for suits make a little bit more sense. Indeed, I, I hadn't heard that yet. And that does make a whole lot yes. more sense. Uh, I And probably to me makes for a more interesting game i i agree i think that theme is better so we've we've already mentioned this many times but in general what people call a a game where the theme and mechanics aren't integrated and especially not integrated at all we tend to call those pasted on themes again like sean said like wallpaper you can always change the wallpaper you can change the theme and it has no effect on the actual gameplay and to me that's what you're not looking for when you want a deeply thematic game And this is even more important when you're talking about themes that are precise, which gets back to the actual topic here, not just generalizing. When you are talking about a specific time period or a specific place, you need that theme to matter. It has to be integrated with mechanics. You don't want to paste it on theme. You want that to matter or else why set the game there? Right. If you're setting a game in feudal Japan, but if you step back, And it could just as easily be armies charging across the fields in Breton. What's the point? Why? Why have you gone with the feudal Japanese theme? Is it just because you think Asian culture is cool? And if so, stop. Yes. Think about what you're doing and think about what that says. 
So, of course, the opposite end are games with good thematic depth, where you're integrating the theme to the mechanics. And the key here is, would the game work without the theme? Is there anything there? Like, yes, mechanically, the game will work, but like, does it make sense? Would you would you still understand it? Or can you easily swap this theme to something else? Right. And what you want, the, the more depth you have, the harder this is. And I'm not saying it's impossible. Any game can be rethemed anything else. But there are ways, which we'll get into some of them, how to make it stick, how how to make that hard to do and make it so. And the, and the whole point here is something we've talked about on the show quite a bit recently is immersion. You want that theme to matter. Right. And especially if you're doing a narrow focused theme where you want someone to, I don't know if you want to feel like you're there, but like, yeah, you want to feel like you're hitchhiking around Belgium or you want to feel the plight of the refugees when the French are coming in. Like that's what you're aiming for with these type of games. Now, one thing I will caveat, we should have started with this. We are not saying deep themed games are better than not deep themed games. They're just two different choices. What we're looking for is deep thematic games where that theme matters is what Danielle's looking for. But I'm not necessarily saying your game has to have a deep theme. Some of our favorite games are highly abstract, like the Duke and Garinto. Absolutely. You don't have to theme a game, but if you are going to theme a game, think about the depth yes. and, and, and keep that in mind uh there you know if your game can if you can strip it all off and you can have turn your game into jenga you know mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't need necessarily need a theme or the theme isn't integrated well enough uh and you should rethink things uh perhaps or mm -hmm. maybe you're just better off having the next jenga uh yep. it doesn't necessarily have to have a theme so i will just throw out there if you do give your name a silly a name a silly game like jenga Google the name first, just to, to kind of hint at a game that had actually really interesting theming that, again, had nothing to do with the game. But then they threw another word in there that meant something totally different than the theme. No matter what you're doing, if you're a game designer, please Google. Google lots. Yeah, just Google, Google different Google. spellings. <laughs> find, check your game yes. name. <laughs> and make sure that when some random person says that name, that someone else will be able to spell it. Yes. Just by hearing we, it. We, we have talked about that. It, <laughs> it, it, your game should be should be spellable. But again, we're, we're drifting. We're a bit. So I'm going I'm to use the chat room to get us back on topic here. So uh, Angie Games, our awesome moderator, said, I saw someone on Board Game Re Geek referring to the opposite of pasted on as heavily bolted, which amused me, which is interesting. Kind of gets the, the Frankenstein theme there, or, you know, riveted on theme. You know, they're hard to separate, yeah. which I think fits. Locked, locked in place makes a lot of sense. Locked in place. They say, to me, deeply thematic makes more sense to me. Um, Ryan's pointing out, given the time from design to table, it seems difficult to land a game in the market when the theme is topic is hot or not. You would not, you would be surprised how short the board game cycle is once the game signed from the publisher to the people. That's often under a year. It's that lead up. It's the play testing. It's the development. And honestly, one of the last things they'll do is put the theme on, on most of those games. So those games where the publisher is retheming it, that theme might've happened a week before in a boardroom before you know, they decided to actually start shipping the game. So not all, like, yeah, some games take 10 years to develop, but some themes don't. Yeah. Uh, I, I would recommend against, you know, starting building your newest uh, hot girls at the mall game right now. It's probably not the best timing. Uh, Unless you're in Windsor. Uh, yeah, I suppose. Um, Windsor does. I don't know what's up with our mall. Mall so. still. It's one of the few in North America that seems to be. Yes. Uh, we, we... Uh, so, so Roger calls a Preda Porter. That's actually a good one. They considered retheming it, but it didn't happen. But that's got some stuff to it. But in um, the the big thing right now is you are we are looking at good thematic depth. What we're doing is is you're you're bolted on as as we just said. It's it's they're well tied together, right? Uh, and there's a lot of games that where it, where it doesn't really work. Uh, one of the things I found, noticed as, as I was sitting down thinking about this entire topic was I actually can't say I have really played that many deeply mm -hmm. thematic games a lot of the other games that i tend to have been attracted to or, or focused on um aren't uh they're either a pasted on theme or abstract um and uh you know one of the one of the most deeply thematic games themed games i can think of is in fact blood bowl which i referenced earlier yeah. um it's hard to separate that one away from its uh it's no, that's a good one it's actually sports games in general are probably a good one but like you're right we we were sitting here even just like we could have taken this topic instead of having a discussion about it done. Here's our top 10 deeply thematic games. 
which I also thought could be a follow up for next week. But I can't think of 10 deeply thematic games I've played. I, it's actually fairly rare uh, that the games aren't just like totally pasted on or, or fairly thin, right? Like loosely screwed on themes <laughs> seem, seem to be fairly common where, yes, there's some things that tie to the theme to the mechanics, but really deep ones are definitely hard to find. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the ones I've called out a number of times uh, is uh, Lords of Waterdeep. Um, you know, it's a fantastic game. It's a great game. But I just sort of feel like it's a Euro and, and someone painted on the D&D uh, graphics and, and text. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, another thing that you do have to talk about when we're talking about themes, especially once you're narrowing down, if you're talking about a specific time period, a specific place, or a specific group of people, is handling that theme in a culturally appropriate way. Yes, for years, people designed games, went, yeah, that theme sounds cool, and they just published it. And people used to write books that way and do movies that way, and we are, we're smarter now. We, we've learned from our mistakes. We see the problem with that, and it's no longer appropriate to set your game in Asia because you think it's cool. That's Orientalism, which yeah. we now realize is a problem. People are... are the, the internet has allowed us to connect with each other in ways where we were able to find out that we were doing things that were offensive that we didn't realize were. And nowadays, it's up to you to make that change and stop doing so. And sadly, this happens far too often. Uh, many game designers, uh, if not most, are well-educated people. And this almost makes the problem worse, as they see certain types of research as the solution to all problems. However, Research in many cases displays the reinforcing of cultural biases that have been passed down through the mm -hmm. white <laughs> nation, you know, the, 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 the cultural appropriation uh, and into that available literature. Uh, and this is what you're avoiding by working with people of that culture yes. who are aware of the biases and able to direct you around such pitfalls when theming a game so yeah when picking a theme for your game or when looking at a game to look at its theme and the depth of it you need to consider this look look at the is it being done culturally appropriately and then when you were on to see how deep it is you're looking at how well that theme is actually tied to the mechanics and i think the big thing here is the games that do it right are games that have a mechanic in there to make the game thematic that, that literally is only there because you're talking about that theme. And that's where you're getting it right. That's where you're getting it get to work. On the other hand, there's games that miss the mark. And we've already talked about a few, but I want to call out a couple games in particular that, that to me totally miss the mark, even though I've heard people call them thematic. Now, this one, I excuse me, this one I haven't actually heard, but Danielle mentioned, mentioned Feudal Japan. And immediately when she mentioned Feudal Japan, sorry, they mentioned the Feudal Japan, an egregious example of this that we reviewed in the past, a game we enjoy. So again, we're not saying the game gameplay is bad because of this, is Gunkimono or Gunkimono. This game has a Japanese theme because people think Japanese is cool and samurai look neat. It has zip to do with the domino-based gameplay of the game. You are stacking dominoes and scoring points for area control which has absolutely nothing, nothing, like, like not even a little bit tied to that theme whatsoever. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, another one that, uh, that I came across, and I haven't actually played this, but I was researching this because, again, I haven't run into a, a lot of this issue before, but Isle of Sky um, mm -hmm. was described as Scottish Carcassonne with an auction thrown in. Uh, and and it, it, it has nothing to do with the deep and rich uh nature of the hand history of scotland yeah uh, they're just using oh scotland is cool oh well, they they did on some of the tiles if i remember there are breweries or there's whiskey <laughs> barrels I th I th i'm pretty sure that that's the the only extent to the scottish theme and i think they call the coins whatever coinage they use in scotland but yes i i totally agree uh isle of sky definitely great game you haven't played it we should play it to me that's the cart killer i love scott Isle of Sky over over. Um, I thought we had land and sea. How many how, how many cart killers are we gonna have here? I don't know lots because <laughs> it's old and crusty and no one plays anymore. No, no offense, cart fans. I still actually like cart because I find it. You need to play with cutthroat people though. I don't like playing cart with friendly people. Are like, oh, I'll help you finish this. No, I want to cut people off and make the big city. So yes, that that is one. Now another one um, that I thought of 
and um, more Deanna brought up. So like Danielle mentioned, they're, they're uh, a history major. Well, my wife is a classics major and she hates when games totally just ignore Roman history, Roman or Greek history. And the absolute worst has got to be Rise of Augustus. We call this game Roman Bingo because that's what it is. You are drafting tiles that have symbols on them of, you know, um, charioteers and laurels and, and legions. And someone is pulling chips from a bag and going legionnaire and everyone covers over their legionnaires. And then once your card's full, you get to score it like it, it it's bingo. There, there is a little strategy there on what cards you draft to make it a little better than bingo. And honestly, it's a fun game. It's a good gateway. Sorry. Was it a welcoming game? It's a good one for new players. But what does that have to do with anything Roman? Did Are Romans known for their bingos? Did, did I miss that? Yeah, no. And now next year, I'm going to call out one of our favorite games, a game we love from a publisher we work with and we do adore. But uh, Garinto is a game that is an abstract game that someone decided to paste the Japanese Buddhist theme onto. It wasn't originally that. It was originally a different uh, theme completely. Um, and they were pitched uh, an idea and, and they, and they, they went a certain direction and that fell through. And then there's, there's been designer diaries and it's, it's been mm. talked to death. I don't want to overgo on, uh, on the, uh, the issue because I know uh, Mark, I'm sure is sick of ever hear, hearing people talk about Garinto, but the fact of the matter is while it is a fantastic game, it is somewhat appropriating Japanese yep. culture and Buddhist culture. Yep. Now, another one Deanna pointed out, and this was the funny one, is Attica. So this was interesting. She's like, well, the first time she played it when she was playing, she's like, yo, no, it's it's tied to its theme, right? Like you are building various things that the Romans built, and a big part of it is building your roads and connecting these things. And it has to do with ho hooking up the temples of the gods. One way to win is to make a complete route between the temples of the gods. And then you get bonus amphoras, which were a sign of wealth to take bonus action. Sounds really thematic, right? Well, another publisher bought the rights to it and rethemed the game to be the U.S. telegraph system. <laughs> Successfully rethemed. It's, it's the exact same game. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, uh, Ryan calls out in the chat room, Clans of Caldonia. And while on its surface, again, when you look at it, it feels like a pretty Scottish game. But when you strip it right down... You know, I, I, you change it from from beer to, uh, you know, some other <laughs> something else. And, and, and you change it from locks to, uh, to to lakes. There's not really anything other than the painted on level of theme on a that really I... fun, enjoyable uh, Scottish game. But it doesn't address any of the, the history and depth of the Scottish people. It treats them all like farmers and sheep herders. So yeah, well, yeah, okay. So they're not, I personally disagree on this one. I think it's a highly thematic game because they put in actual Scottish clans. They did the history on the Scottish clans and found out what they're good at, gave them mechanics in the game to make those clans good at those things. They took the things that, that, that the Scottish people did farm and the things they're well known for and made a game around it. And no, you can't just watch the theme. You would have to redesign parts of that game to work with a different theme. If you wanted to do... Greek, you'd have to look at famous Greek families and what they do. You couldn't be, well, well, this is the fishing family. This is the one that gets double for shipping. And this is the one that instead, um, I don't remember what all the different clans do in that game. I, I personally think that one's got a pretty deep theme. Maybe not the deepest, and maybe they didn't quite dive deep enough. But I think Clans of Caledonia actually did a really good job of making it unique to the Scottish I mean, I think, I think in, in, in some ways you're right. But at the same time, uh, again, there are, I'm sure there are Greek families that fished, and I'm sure there are Greek families that made wine instead of whiskey. But again, you have to redesign those. But, but it, again, it's just, that's just a little bit of research on what family did what. That doesn't speak to anything inherently Scottish, I think, is, is, the, is the thing. It's, it's just the name of a clan. Uh, see, I, I still disagree. I think if you try to dig even deeper, you're trying to make a historical game about Scotland, which is a totally different topic. If you're trying to make a historical educational game, you're taking it a step further. Then you're getting into games like Freedom the Underground Railroad, which is a great example of a thematic game with mechanics tied to to um, to the actual theme. And like, I can't even mention the name of some of the the cubes in that game because <laughs> it would be seen as offensive and the game handles it appropriately. 
I think I, I don't want to say there can be too much depth, but I think for a board game trying to just have a theme and make it a fun game without trying to teach history, I think Clans of Caledonia kind of nails it. And, and again, that's fine. But again, what we're what we've said all along is you don't need to have a deep theme. Uh, right. To me, a fun game. I, we all love Clans of Caledonia. Everyone here is a fan fan of the game Clans of Caledon Caledonia. Uh, I'm just not sure that I couldn't over a weekend spin it into a different. Uh, a different uh, nature if I wanted to. All right, that one's on the fence then. So let's let's go to the other side of the fence and try to find some games that we think actually did get it right. Um, the reason we're reviewing the Belgian beer race tonight as part of this podcast episode is because I think it fits this theme. It, 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 I find it fairly deeply thematic. Uh, this is a game that only works because people travel, travel to Belgium and backpack and try to hit the breweries and collect glassware and collect coasters. Um, all the breweries in the game are real and what actions you can take at each brewery is actually based on actual places. Like there's a brewery where you can't do a tasting. You can't take anything to go because yes, you can't. All you can do is go and visit and watch them brew beer because they only sell their beer to select people. Um, the length of the bus routes is based on real things. And just the whole feel of the game going on a trip with a bunch of friends in Belgium. Like, yes, you could re-theme the game again. You could, uh, we're going to mention a review. You could do the, 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 the German Pilsner beer tour, but you would have to change so much about the game that it would be a totally separate game. It wouldn't just be Monopoly with a different theme. Uh, one I think is an interesting one, and I, I, I'm tempted to say this is is deeply themed, but it's it's hard to say. But uh, the 1824 election game, and I, I'm trying, to, I'm blanking on the name of it now. Um, we've just recently reviewed uh, Revolution of yeah, Re uh, was it Revolution of 1824. No, that doesn't sound right at all. That's eight. Um, Stefan Feld, on yes. a blank on. On the year, uh, I'm Revolution of 1828. Yes, Revolution of 1828. I this is a simple game, but in it it uses such a complex system of of voting and moving with the parties and making use of the media that while yes you could probably retheme it as something else, it would take a good chunk of work to make this bizarre set of mechanics they've put together um, work in, a, in something else. Whereas, you know, it, it fits into this really interesting and unique election uh, in the U S history quite well. I disagree on that one too, but that's all right. Know. That that one to me is a pure abstract. They paste it on a theme and while well, Stefan Feld originally wrote it with a different theme completely. So that was the publisher tossing on a theme because of the popularity of a game I do think is highly thematic, and that's Twilight Struggle. So this is a game where you are trying to influence different areas of the world, and it's the U.S. versus the Soviets during the Cold War. And there are a couple mechanics in that that only work for that. For one, the DEF contract. Like, the, in, in, during that game, it is a competitive game, but if you both mess up enough, the world ends because of World War III. And that is a DEF contract. And the other is the tug of war for victory points in that game which is represented well in a couple other games, which even that um, the 1828, where as you get influence, you move along a victory point track. And it's not you gain points and your opponent gains points, but you actually pull a point thing back and forth. And at the end of the game, depending on where on the scale that is, it determines who wins, which I think very does a very good job of abstractly representing the Cold War. Fair enough. Now, one of the best uh, goes back to our topic of immersion is nyctophobia. Like, I don't know how you could more deeply, I, I guess if the theme was blindness, it would fit better. But like being scared in the dark, not knowing what's around you and having to feel around, that is totally immersed in nyctophobia. This is a game where you literally wear blindfold, blackout glasses, all but one player. Uh, the characters are trying to fumble around find each other and then get back to the car before they're murdered. And then the murderer is the person who can see where they all are. And, and like, I don't think you can do a better last girl type of movie or final girl. I said that style. I don't think you could do a better version of that. Fair enough. And I think going along with that, another deeply uh, theme one to me would be shadows in the forest, which we've talked yep. about a bit recently with, with the, the light that moves around the board and, you're the you're trying to hide in the shadows created by 3D uh, yes. pieces on the board. 
a game about shadows that uses shadows. Yeah, like, that actually it, uses it, you, you can't shadows. really get anybody. I can't disagree with that one whatsoever. So, and Jeff Seuss was pointing out, saying, when Roger said mechanics should drive the theme and, and art enhance it, not the other around, he was right. He's saying that you still target a theme first, but the mechanics should be what you're focused on when targeting the theme. The art, as in the graphics, should be what comes last. Yes, art is different. Art and theme are two, the, the art can match the theme and may not. That's, that's a totally different topic. Same with graphic design. I think you can totally start with the theme and then go the other way. I've done it when I've written games myself, RPGs. I came up with the theme of I wanted to play um, the Littles. I wanted the Borrowers. I wanted Rats and Nim. I wanted I wanted little little heroes dealing with big problems. From that, I decided the best way to do this would make a game where the smallest dice was better. The smaller the die was better. So I came up with the theme, and then I thought of a mechanic that tied to that theme. The entire goal of that game is to shrink your dice to nothing. You start off with a difficulty die that's big and you do things in it to work the die down smaller and smaller because in that game, every mechanic I put in it, smaller is better. In all cases, smaller is better. So there's a perfect example of a game. You can download it right now. It's called the Diminutive RPG because I didn't come up with a cooler name than that when I wrote it over at RPGGeek.com. It's over there for free if anyone wants to grab it. It's a game I keep meaning to play test and go further with, but I never find time to. I, I think it can go either way. Well, fair enough. Uh, now we we're talking you... about um, specific games that do it well, but I think war games in general do a better job of this than Euros in, in your average game because they are based on a specific period and time period and what they do to make them unique. Like they might use all the same system, right? So we're going to take Hammer of the Scots, which is, is Braveheart the board game, except based on the historical facts and not necessarily where the movie went, where, where you've got the, the British against the Scottish and the wars that ensued. And it's a cube block game. So it's from Columbia Games, and it's a cube system game. Well, Columbia puts out a bunch of those. A uh, second very thematic one from that is, is Julius Caesar. The basic mechanics are the same. You put blocks out when they battle, you roll in the combat table, you rotate the dice, but then they throw in specific rules for that setting. Things like on turn three, William Wallace comes out. And when this happens, this happens. All of those parts of the game is what adds the depth to it. So the basic system of cube battles is, is just a mechanic. It can have any theme. And then you could just paste a theme on that and play, which is what um, Wizard Kings does. Because that lets you play any fantasy race. And they even did blind boosters for it to show just how randomly you could set things up and you randomly generate maps. Or you can take that and just by tying in even one mechanic, even one thing which could be the game end, could make the game more deeply thematic. Even if like, the game ends when this happens because historically that happened, you've already tied that theme in more. But then you throw in at the start of the game, this happens. And halfway through the game, here's one from Julius Caesar, Cleopatra can swap sides in that game. So that's something based on historical thing and no other cube game has a unit that can swap sides. And, and that's really a lot of, of what you need to think about when you're looking at whether a game is deeply thematic or not. Is there something in the rules specific to that theme? Mm -hmm. uh, if, if, you know, if you're going the samurai route, is there something in the rules that represents something honestly from the samurai other than, you know, just samurais look cool or ninjas are ninjas are sneaky or, or something, something else orientalist, um, yes. you know, is, have you found that connection between the theme, the feel, and the actual play mm -hmm. of the game. And then Roger brings up a fantastic example of modern wargaming. So for years, war games were one to four players per side, battling out the side that won wins the game with various victory conditions. But then came along the coin games, the counterinsurgency games where someone sat back and went, yeah, but the thing is, these people who are going to war each have their own different objectives which not necessarily is wipe out the other unit or just take that bunker. There's a lot more going on behind the scenes. And that's what the coin games are about. Now, I've only played one of these myself, Fire in the Sky, which was about the Vietnam War. But America's goal in the Vietnam War was very different than North Vietnam's goal in the Vietnam War, which couldn't be represented by traditional hex encounter games. And the coin games do a fantastic job of doing that. But just to point out that theme can only go so deep, you have Root, which is a coin game about woodland animals battling in a forest. So <laughs> there is definitely that aspect of it. Absolutely. 
Now, uh, I'm going to call out one more that I think was highly thematic because it needs more shout outs. I don't even know if you can get it, but the Red Bernoose Algeria 1857. This is a cooperative deck building war game that I found to feel very thematic that had me do more um, research into Algeria and the French occupation of Algeria because I didn't know enough about this time. It's the, the, the things in there, like the type of characters you hire. You are hiring like men and women to do things and you are ar arming them the way the French army moves, what little defenses you have, how little time you have to organize. These are all mechanical elements that just reinforce the theme of that game and made you feel desperate, which was what was important. That was the message they were trying to get across. You wanted to feel desperate and feel like you had no chance. Yeah, and that's one of the the big things, especially, you know, and everyone knows one of my favorite uh, game types are deck builders. And these can really span the whole, mm. whole range from from DC de uh, deck builder. And as Mo has said many, many times, it just doesn't feel right. You, no. you know, you've got a Batman card in front of you, but you're grabbing Wonder Woman's lasso and, and you know, Plastic Man's ability to stretch. It feels weird. Uh, mm -hmm. Or you got something like Red Bernus, um, or or even the the legendary games, uh, you know, where you've got things that are building tension. Uh, Hellbringer with their tension, the the the, mm -hmm. the 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 time system that gives you that mounting tension that you know they're about to to come across the wall and crush you, and you will lose. Um, there's a, a wide range uh, of. I think thematic, you meant Draconis Invasion. Sorry, Draconis Invasion, yes. Uh, a wide range of of things. Well, in Hellbringer, you've got a different thing where if you're playing teams, so you you have different ranges of vision. So some mm -hmm. people can see further into the into the mist and see monsters further away than you, and you don't necessarily you aren't able to react to all the creatures yep. out there against you. Uh, yeah, that was what Hellbringer was trying to pull in the theme of a fog of war into a a roguelike deck building card well it wasn't deck building but card game yeah and that was their goal was to get that across and i think they did a good job on that aspect absolutely all right do we have anything else in the chat room before we move on because i think we kind of got our point across that we rambled a bit there talking about games that are thematic and not uh what i'll do while i give the chat one last chance to jump in is just to kind of summarize that you have games with pasted on themes where you can swap the theme out for anything else change the wallpaper game doesn't change and then you have Somewhat thematic games where it's a little deeper and then heavily bolted on themes or deeply thematic games where the actual mechanics of the game are based on the theme and the other way around. That is is what we're talking about here. And the main thing is, I think the, the final point I want to make is the more narrow your theme, the more you have to do this, the more depth your game needs. If you are looking at a specific region of Japan, give me a reason for it to matter I'm in that specific region of Japan. If you are looking at a certain class of people like Algerians, um, give me a game where it matters that I'm now looking at that group of people. That's where I think it matters. And also be very careful. Um, hire cultural consultants. Make sure you are handling the topic appropriately. One of the things to me that says whether or not you have managed to achieve a game with thematic depth is how I talk about it the next morning, the next day. Yeah. If I'm sitting around and saying, oh, I played this game about Germany last night, you would not believe it. As opposed to, oh, I played this board game last night. Uh, yeah, it was set in um, uh, Germany. And so we about uh, this, this mechanic and this was really the mechanic. Mm -hmm. If I'm talking about the mechanics and, and, and completely have forgotten what your theme is, yep. maybe you didn't quite get it as deep as you, you could have. All right, well, that's it for our talk on thematic board games, something we would love to see more of. What are some games you've played that you think get it right and have mechanics that make the theme actually important in the game? Tell us about it in the comments below. Now we're about to check in with our lobby here on Twitch, but before that, a quick reminder, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. You can send questions to us by going to the website, tabletopbellhop.com, and clicking on Ask the Bellhop, send an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or send a message through social media where we can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. 